Now we're going to talk about submucosal masses, a little bit of trauma, and we're going to use the anatomy that we learn. You should learn the anatomy using cancer cases because that's the best and most precise. But now we're going to use that anatomy and talk about submucosal masses and a little bit about trauma. So look how different this is from a squamous cell. There's no ulcerated lesion. And here, this is the endolarynx. And now all there is is a bulge in under the mucosa. So our approach to this is to make, ask very specific questions. Is this a chondroid tumor? And we'll say yes or no. If it is a no, if it is yes, then we stop. But if it's not, we'll say, is it a laryngocele? Yes or no? If it's no for both of these, we're just going to put them all in a group. We're going to say it's something else. It's going to need to be biopsied. And we'll say you have to go in uh, and we'll, uh, to biopsy it. And we'll try to say whether or not uh, it's going to be uh, likely to have a lot of hemorrhage. So let's see how that works. These are all chondrosarcomas. All right, this is number one. The first thing it will do is it will expand a cartilage. It can be the thyroid cartilage or the cricoid. And occasionally, we've seen one of the arytenoid. Occasionally, it'll arise from the joint, but it's pretty rare. So what are we going to do with this? Well, these are low-grade malignancies. And as soon as we make the diagnosis, they will decide. They can do a total laryngectomy and cure the patient, but these are low grade enough that most of these at our institution will be followed. And they will debulk the lesion to get at least the airway back, but they won't try to do a total resection. The landmark that we're gonna talk about over and over again will be the cricoarethnoid joint. So here, lots of mineralization and expansion. Here, you can see how little of the airway is left. And here, again, you would have a lot of difficulty. You get air, uh, exercise and tolerance. This small lesion, even though there's not a lot of mineralization, you can see expansion. And if it's in the cartilage, that's going to be almost certainly a chondrosarcoma. We've seen a plasmacytoma. We've seen a metastasis, but very seldom, almost all, will be chondrosarcs. Here's an MR, and again, we don't favor MR for this either. Why? Because you can see the mineralization much better, and you can imagine they'd have trouble holding still. But here is the tumor expanding the cricoid cartilage coming up. Here's the ventricle, thyroretinoid muscle, Here's the supraglottic fat, et cetera. So here is the tumor, but look how much nicer it's evaluated using CT. And look how much better you can see the lesion as it approaches the cricoarethnoid joint. Now they can, they can modify their voice, so even if it involves the joint, they can still talk pretty well. And they very frequently will have a relatively normal voice but usually they're hoarse, but their big complaint will be that they can't breathe, particularly when they exercise. So in this particular patient, what the surgeon did was take off about this much and leave plenty of tumor, which we're now gonna follow forever, right on the cricoid side of the cricoarethnoid joint, so right there. Now this is a, I think the cricoretinoid joint is really a very interesting joint. It's important to know that it isn't right in midline, but you need to know where it is because a chondrosarcoma would be coming up right close to that particular joint. But as long as it can slide, you can get and you can adjust to get a relatively normal voice. So here is a chondrosarcoma. If we follow this up, a little bit of mineralization, follow it right up, and here's the cricoretinoid joint due to the bone algorithm. That is what the clinician will want to know. What's the bulk? Can they take that out? And what is the relationship? How close can they get 
to the cricoretinoid joint. I've seen one or two almost complete resections, but this seems to be where they will leave it, right at that upper edge of the cricoid. All right, well, let's say we have something different. Now, this is the ventricle. Here's thyroid cartilage and cricoid. If it isn't a chondrosarcoma, and we look at it, and usually we say, yes, it is, or no, it isn't. But let's say we decided it wasn't. So the next question is, is it a laryngocele or saccular cyst? A lot of people would say that if it's filled with air, it's a laryngocele, fluid, saccular cyst. But I think air or fluid-filled laryngocele actually is easier to remember. What is it? Well, here's the ventricle. Here is the appendix. The appendix is just a little tube that goes up into the supraglottic, paraglottic space. So a laryngocele or saccular cyst is going to be a little cystic structure that's above the ventricle, filling that space and getting rid of the fat. And so we can be very accurate. Here are a couple of old slides with a fluid-filled, here air-filled laryngocele. Notice you're at the level where there is fat. You're above the level of the ventricle. Here is another one. This patient had had radiation and now presents with a big bulge in the upper part of the larynx. Well, this looks very much like a cyst. Here's the mucosa. They look up, they see this bulge. Here are the airy epiglottic folds right here, swollen because of the radiation. But here is this mass. And it's important to know here you follow it down. Since the patient's been radiated, you have a little bit of enhancement of the mucosa. So you can see the other ventricle very nicely. You follow this down, and this is an important concept. Yes, the laryngocele or saccular cyst is completely benign, but it can be associated with a tumor at the level of the ventricle. And that's what this patient had. So we make the diagnosis of laryngocele, saccular cyst, but then we have to look carefully, and so does the clinician. They have to look to make sure nothing is obstructing that. All right, how about these three cases? These three cases, it's not really in the thyroid cartilage, not quite in the paraglottic space. Here, this was a case of a paraganglioma. This one isn't really enhancing as much. This was a synovial sarcoma. This was some sort of malignancy arising deep in the ventricle. It could have been minor salivary gland. You can get schwannomas, et cetera. But they don't look like a saccular cyst. They're not filled with fluid. I guess if you had protein, maybe. But this was a little solid tumor. This one probably wouldn't bleed much, either with this at biopsy, but this one would actually bleed quite a bit, and this was a paraganglioma. All right, now let's just briefly talk about trauma, and you all know about uh, everybody that's done any of these or worked in an ER will look for cricoid fractures, thyroid fractures, maybe a retinoid dislocation. We just want to bring up, and this is a good way to review, the more uh, the what happens to the wall of the larynx. Remember, in the subglottis, there should be no soft tissue. And here, we have a cricoid fracture. Some of these are actually missed in the, e, in the emergency room. But here's a point. I've never seen a cricoid fracture, an acute one, where you don't have soft tissue within the ring. So here, you've got soft tissue. And in the acute phase, there's almost always that. Then you look more carefully, and here is the anterior cricoid. There's a fracture here and here. But always look for the subglottic edema. If you don't see it, here's a patient with a fracture, a little bit of edema or hemorrhage into the wall. And here, this, if you see this finding, there's really no soft tissue within. So, bottom line, if that looks as pristine as this, very unlikely to have a cricoid fracture and you can move on.
Here, this is at the level of the true chord. So three levels, supraglottic, glottic, and subglottic. At the level of the glottis, we have to look, because here, if you have a vertical fracture of the thyroid cartilage, this is what's clinically most important. Here's the muscle. It attaches to the cartilage. You have a vertical fracture of the cartilage. Then this needs to be repaired because you'll end up with a very hoarse voice. They'll take this part of the cartilage, move it further forward, and put a plate across so that they can put stretch into uh, the vocal ligament and thyroretinoid muscle again. At the level of the supraglottis, we're going to look at our friend, the supraglottic fat. If you don't see any edema, hemorrhage, then this fracture isn't present. This is a horizontal fracture, supraglottic, probably tearing the epiglottis. But here's the finding. You get hemorrhage into the supraglottis. So why is that useful? Here's a case that came into us with the diagnosis of cricoid fracture. All right, we just said that it's very unusual to have a cricoid fracture if you don't have swelling. So we can't see the cricoid well, but we would say there's not really a lot of evidence. But then we look, the cord level, and then the supraglottis, and we don't see that supraglottic fat. Here you can make out the epiglottis, but there's hemorrhage there. And so we did some reformats on the outside study, and look what happened. You had complete transection of the larynx, and the supraglottis is retracted up along with the epiglottis, and here would be the true cord level. So what was our indicator? This was our indicator, the hemorrhage into the supraglottic fat. Just very briefly mentioning vocal cord paralysis. Vocal cord paralysis, we don't usually make that diagnosis. Why? Because it's already made. But here are the findings that we get, and many of them are related to our friend, the thyroretinoid muscle. So it'll bring us back to the beginning of the lecture. That's an, uh, innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Here's the normal one with a normal ventricle. This is the finding of vocal cord paralysis. You get a big ventricle, and you get that because the thyroretinoid muscle is atrophying and getting smaller. So the ventricle just takes up that space. Some of the other findings, big uh, piriform sinus, you may see the vocal ligament. And then finally, the posterior cricoretinoid also may be atrophied. And you can see that along the back wall of the cricoid. Here, if you see that amount of muscle, then you may have an acute uh, vocal cord paralysis, but you're not really going to have uh, a chronic one. It will turn to fat. So what I've tried to do in the last little bit is give you sort of our approach to most things in the larynx. Now remember, there are not a lot of decisions that need to be made because the clinicians can really see them in almost every situation. They can see the true cord, they can see the ventricle, they can uh, uh, see the anterior commissure, so they diagnose virtually every cancer that we see. I think I've diagnosed maybe three in my entire uh, career. But here are the key landmarks. The ventricle, the cricoid, particularly the upper edge, right there, and remember the paraglottic space, because that's really what we're looking for. We also talked a little bit about the cartilage. Here, does tumor go into it or not? So I want to thank you for your time and attention and the opportunity to talk a little bit about the larynx and our approach to it. Thank you kindly.